Welcome to Inside the Sales Playbook, where on each and every episode, we dive into the actual sales processes, plays, and strategies working for successful sales teams today. No high-level overview. We get into the actual weeds of what some of the fastest growing and most successful sales teams are doing today to drive revenue and grow their businesses. And we have two sponsors of the show. Our first sponsor is by SalesKit. SalesKit takes the guesswork out of scaling your sales knowledge all on one great platform. Platform. No longer does your sales team have to spend hours every day digging through various Google Docs, Dropbox folders, or even saving it locally. SalesKit makes it easier than ever for your team to access the sales knowledge that actually works as well as your best practices. You can sign up for a free trial at Get saleskit.com. And we're also sponsored by a book. That's my book, Raise Your Standards, The Definitive Guide to Building Seven-Figure Sales. You can get a free copy of this book to help grow your sales, whether you're an entrepreneur, sales leader, or sales contributor at getsaleskit.com forward slash book. I'm your host, Mark Evans. And today I'm here with Mr. Tim Warren. Tim has a really interesting career. He started by going to med school. I want to get into that a little bit and how he shifted gears. He now leads a company that has over 50 employees. They've been recognized uh, as an innovation 50 on fire, as well as various other awards. They'd qualify for an Inc. 5000, uh, but they're not old enough yet. They're growing at such a fast rate. So I'm really excited to talk to Tim today. Tim, welcome to the show. Mark, thanks for having me on, man. Oh uh, yeah, we're so excited. Well, thanks so much, Tim, for coming on. And how about we start off by giving the listeners just a little bit of context. What is Helium SEO and how do you help your clients achieve their mission? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so quick background. So Helium, actually, we started in early or early 2017. We had been building out artificial intelligence technology. Um, we basically had this, this crazy idea, which is, hey, what if you took an agency and, and built a bunch of technology using AI and created a better service product, not just another SaaS company, right? Mm-hmm. What, if you, what if you could do something like that? And so that was our original mission. And, you know, 50 employees and five offices later, it's been successful. Wow. Um, so so that was our original idea. So I've been in SEO since 2011. Uh, okay. So this is my second company. I owned an agency that got acquired by a, a spinoff of PNG, um, and then once my non-compete ran out, we started Helium. So I had experience in the space. I knew about SEO, and I'd worked with you know uh, Fortune 1000, Fortune 500s, and also you know good size and mid-sized local companies. Um, so I knew that space, but um, but that was the, the genesis of Helium, if you will. Um, you know, day day one, it was let's go take this idea. We took it to a trade show. If you if you're if you know anything about SEO, there's this big trade show every year in New York. Uh, it were, used to be pre-COVID, yeah. but it's called SMX, right? And it was put okay. on by by Search Engine Land, Search Engine Journal, Third Door Media. So Google's there, Bing is there, Bruce Clay is there. We went to that first trade show and we literally walked the trade show and talked to everybody we could about our new product and idea. Uh, nobody bought. Everybody hated the the first iteration, but that's how it goes when you start companies, right? You you try yeah. something, you learn, you adapt. Um, so that's where we ended up today, and then. Um, you know, but, you know, our, our, our growth path is, is we want to continue to grow in, in both geographic markets. So we've, we've opened five offices and Backlinko did a study that 65% of companies want to work with a local SEO firm. Okay. So we've tried, we've tried to continue to grow with a local presence, not mm. just a national presence because people, they don't know what SEO, they don't fully understand it. A lot of them, it feels like this black magic, you know, voodoo, mm-hmm. how do you raise Google rankings? So we try to have a local presence where people can build a deep relationship with our team. That makes a lot of sense. I really like that. Thank you for that background. Let's start off a little bit before I kind of uh, hinted at it in the preview. You started going to med school. I mean, man, how the heck did you even pivot out of, you know, going for your doctors uh, and then getting into this crazy thing of entrepreneurship and sales? Take the audience there. So I, I grew up in a small town of Virginia right? Um, you know, w- was there since I was like six years old, all the way up to, to 17. Yeah. I, growing up, you know, in, in Virginia, I grew in a little town called Blue Ridge, Virginia. And I, I knew like three types of people. I knew, I knew doctors, I knew pastors, and, and I knew their kids. <laughs> <laughs> One, of those, One of those three. That was it. So, that was it. so you're telling me that there wasn't any SEO experts hanging out there, in Blue Ridge, Virginia? There was not. No, there, <laughs> yeah. you know, and at the time, I mean, I'm 34, right? So it was like yeah. Netscape Navigator, Alta Vista, Yahoo, right? Yeah. So, so these are all like tech companies on the West Coast. I'd never been to California. I didn't know anything about SEO. So, so growing up, I, I, when I was a kid, I was five years old. I had this a minor surgery, um, you know, nothing serious, just an outpatient thing. But I fell in love with the hospital and the mm-hmm. atmosphere and, and all of the coolness of the science of, of everything medical. So when I was a five-year-old kid, I'm like, I want to be a doctor. 
that's what I want to do. Like, I want to be a surgeon. This is super cool. So I wasn't one of those kids that like wanted to be an astronaut and a firefighter and then, you know, uh, you know, a basketball player and then whatever else. Right. I, I was just super, super focused on one thing. That's how I always am. Like, this is what I'm going to do. And I'm going to do it. So I go all the way, you know, through undergrad and college. And I had a couple of advisors who were physicians um, and they gave me good advice. They said, look, Tim, you know, you're going to have to, you're a white male. So you're going to have to be the best of the best of the best, right? Mm-hmm. You need to have the highest MCAT. You need to have the highest. So you got to be laser focused. So I did. And I'm going all the way through school and I'm being, I, I think I calculated, I studied about 4,000 hours in college to get, wow. I, I had straight A's all the way through college, right? That's um, incredible. Never got to be in my life kind of thing. Uh, maybe in elementary school. So I was this focused, right? Yeah. Well, I finally graduate and I took a year off to just in between college and med school to make some money because I, I, you know, my parents, I never had enough money. They didn't pay for school. So I, mm-hmm. I didn't come from a lot of money. You bootstrapped college is what you're I saying. I bootstrapped college and, and med school is ultra expensive. So yeah. it, the reason I'm telling you all this is this matters for my sales journey. That year off that I spent between college and med school was the first time I had a full-time job making 17 bucks an hour. I worked at a factory driving a forklift outside near my hometown or outside near my college, mm-hmm. um, you know, in Springfield, Ohio, and waking up at 5 a.m. every day to go to this job. It taught me, wow, I'm, I'm kind of bored by jobs. Mm. And, and, and this interesting thing started to happen to me where I started realizing like, I don't like making money this way. Like trading time for dollars is not something I enjoy. So mm-hmm. I started reading books. I'm like, how do I make more money? How do I make mm-hmm. money in a better way, a different way? And this was weird for me because I'd never taken an economics class, a business class. I'd already graduated college. I was already accepted to med school by this point, but something triggered in me by driving to this job every single morning. And I realized it, even if I'm making more per hour as a general practicing physician, like, where's the excitement? What, what am I building? Can I go do yeah. new things? And, and that led me on a journey to, to find entrepreneurship. And, and that's uh-huh. where I found entrepreneurship. I met a guy who's entrepreneurial and this guy's starting companies left and right. I'm like, that looks super fun. So I start med school and I have this weird side hustle where I'm like, I want to be an entrepreneur mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm, you know, studying to be a doctor. And at the end of the day, you know, it kind of came down to this head where I had to decide. I had to pick, wow. right? Um, yeah. Where it was like, are you going to finish out med school or do you really want to chase this entrepreneurship dream and go do this thing? Um, so, I, I mean, I'm a risk taker, right? Like, yeah. I go for it. And at the end of the day, I sat down and had that, you know, Benjamin Franklin, I did a pro con list where it's what are the pros and what are the cons? Um, and, and my med school, I went to OU, Ohio University, and they have, they have a policy like Harvard. If you've started med school there and you leave for a personal reason, you know, in this case, you know, I wanted to try something. Yeah. It, as long as you kept up a couple, you know, statistics correct, you could always return. Oh, nice. So, okay. So I so, was like, well, the risk is pretty low. It's not yeah. like I can never go back if I decide, let me take off a year and go do entrepreneurship. And if it totally bombs, I'm screwed. Yeah. I could, I could go back. So the risk wasn't that high. That makes a lot of sense, but you still took that risk. And I'm curious because you mentioned something before, and I know this is a little off topic, but it, I, we're scratching my own itch here today. Yeah. Uh, you know, you said that you were really big into studying and especially the science of clinics and hospitals. Yeah. That scientific approach, how has that helped you um, both in entrepreneurship and then specifically with your field of expertise being SEO? That's a really good question, Mark. And, it, and the answer is tremendously. So the best SEOs are are people who are both right and left brained. So mm-hmm. on the right right brain side, you have to have creativity because nobody buys marketing from somebody who's dull and who's not creative. Yeah. Right. And I, yeah. I actually I tell I talk to my sales team about this all the time. Is when you're in a pitch with somebody, you've got to think about their brand and you've got to have aha moments mm-hmm. because. I've sold a lot of, of marketing services in the last nine years, um, but, you know, working for Lamar Outdoor Advertising, you know, working for large print publishers before I, I you know, so I worked for some large agencies and, and uh, mm-hmm. print, uh, print and digital and outdoor companies before I, I started my companies. And every one of them is the same. Nobody buys marketing for someone who doesn't have ideas about how to grow their brand. Sure. But if you can walk into a company and say, oh, I have an idea. What if you guys did this? Mm-hmm. People love buying from that guy because yeah. he he has passion and excitement and ideas for growing their brand. So as a if you're going to do well in SEO or any marketing sales, you've got to have creativity. You have to have mm-hmm. that right brain. But then you you need to have the left brain too where you can pull up Google Analytics and analyze data trends and and, and what is this data telling me. Yeah. And so I've actually found that people aren't successful in sales at, at Helium or at any of my companies if they don't possess both sides. They've got to be able to have the left brain analytical and be able to look at data and understand, take a scientific approach. But then they also have to have creativity. If they have one or the other, they typically don't make it. 
Yeah. And now is there any way, because I'm sure there's a lot of other um, you know, entrepreneurs and sales leaders who are listening to this saying, yes, exactly. We need either more of that in our organization or we need to hire people just like that. Are there yeah. any is there anything that you do in your interview process that helps you filter out and screen for individuals that can access both that left uh, and that right side of the brain? Yeah, that's a good question. So what um, Netflix, if you never looked at this, look at Netflix's HR team. Uh, hmm. They've actually read, they've written some books you can, you can, um, yeah. you can read about, but what they found is their best engineers were, you know, could code and were into music. Ah, okay. And music showed their right brain ability and then their coding showed their left brain ability. So at Helium, we tried to take that same path and figure out what are the typical ways we could, we could figure out based on resume and interview Someone is both creative as well as left brain. So here's what we did, um, Mark, and here's what we do in our interview. We structure our interview to not to be, you know, let me know your background. Let me go through your resume. We, we structure interviews to actually learn about the person's skill set and weaknesses like this one. Are they really creative? And you can, you can structure your questions to do that. So what we do is, is the, the first interview comes in and we just, you know, who are you, background, why do you want to be an SEO, all that kind of stuff. The second interview, you know, if they impress us, we come back and we say, tell me about one of your hobbies, right? Mm. We get them totally off of SEO. Let's just see how they talk about something they're really knowledgeable and passionate about. Do yeah. they have hobbies? Are they really into things? How creative are those hobbies? How technical are those hobbies? Let's say you build computers on the side for fun. Well, that's interesting. Why computers? Why do you build them? How'd you learn about it? Yeah. And you, and you, and you can find out really quickly when someone talks about their hobby, is this person interesting and fun? And are they technical on their own, right? Yeah. Other things that we do is, is we'll actually, this is, this is fun, but to see their creativity um, in the sales process, in the interview, we'll, we'll, we'll give them, you know, we'll, we'll say, Hey, we're going to pop out for 10 minutes. Hey, here's a cheat sheet. Here's a company. Here's a tool. Get, do, do 10 minutes of research on this company. I'm going to come back in and then pitch me as though you worked for Helium and this was my company. Come pitch nice. me on this product. And so it tests their ability to learn really quickly and how creative can they be? Cause they're going to have to make up a lot of what they're saying there. So can they be creative and learn like, okay, you guys do SEO. This is a plumbing company. Okay. Um, oh, I have an idea. What if we did this, 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 and this? Yeah. Right? And that's can, a perfect, that's a good candidate for you. Someone who's already coming to the table with that's not right. only, hey, I'm understanding the background, but here's right. the ideas I can bring. Here's the result that I know you want to get. And, and so what it does is it puts them under pressure. It doesn't yeah. give them time to prep. It makes, to, it tests their creativity on the spot, right? How creative can this person be under pressure? And that's what we're looking for. Because people can can be creative over long periods of time and they yeah. ask their friends or whatever, but that's not true creativity. Creativity is what can you come up with on your own? So that's how Love we that. do it. We structure an interview process where it forces them to either sink or swim based on here's very limited information, like what can you come up with on the spot? And that's that's a way to test their, A, their ability to kind of run with it and BS, mm -hmm. if you will but also their ability to be creative. Has there ever been a situation that I, I'm curious, Tim, where you have had a candidate where you're like, oh, this is a perfect candidate. We know that they're going to do great, right? Maybe they do great in the first interview or maybe you know them and then they get to that scenario and just totally bomb and like your whole world flips upside down. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, that's, I mean, that was, that's why we do a three-step interview process, right? Is, is for that reason. You get, you get people to that stage and then they just bomb. They're like, oh, this is terrible, right? Yeah. Um, oh, we've totally seen that. Um, That's awesome. And, and well, I will say this for anybody who's hiring salespeople is go with your gut. Um, don't take the risk. Most mm. of the time you'll know if this person's nailing it and you can, you can feel that, you know, flex on the comp and get that person in and hire the great yeah. people. But it's always when you know you're settling in sales that it just doesn't work well because it's like, well, they weren't really that creative and their answers weren't really that good. But I got to get someone in this role by you know the end of next yeah. two weeks. Demand. Don't do it. Go back to the go back to the board. Get more candidates and get the right person because it almost never works out when you put the wrong person in sales. That is such good advice because I think even when you start that relationship off, it's like anything. If you're starting off saying like, ah, well, I don't really want this. I've done this ordering at restaurants. Like right, I really right. want that steak, but I'm going to get this for whatever reason. And the rest of the night is just like blown, right? It's like, ah, why did totally. I even bother to do that? The relationship starts off on the totally wrong foot. I love that. That is such good advice. So let's talk a little bit about how do you transition from you've recruited somebody, you've got them in the door. What is the onboarding and training process look like? And I'm really Really curious for you to dive in here, Tim, because mm. SEO and the services you provide, there is no shortage of competition, right? It's a highly competitive market. So yes. how do you help build a sales culture that can help compete and be successful at the level that you guys have? 
Yeah, no, that's a really good question, Mark. And you're absolutely right. There's 18,000 SEO <laughs> companies in the US. So it's not can, a small amount. Yeah. <laughs> no, you can fall off a log and hit like four companies on the way down, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so so here's the here's the first thing I'll tell anybody who's watching. So the first thing is you, you got to know who you want to be when you grow up, right? Um, as a when you start the company, uh, you know, if people watching are founders or executives or you know, based on who's watching. Yeah. I'm assuming it's probably more owners or decision yep. makers, right? Mostly entrepreneurs, some sales leaders as well. Yeah, exactly. So first is you got to know who you want to be when you grow up. So what I mean by that is, are you the cheap SEO firm? Are you known for the mm. cheapest SEO? Well, it's going to be a different sales type of person yep. to sell that product, right? It's going to be, you know, churn and burn. People are going to come in and go, you're going to have low quotas. You're just going to want to try to get mass people through the door and it's a churn and burn culture. Are you, you know, selling only to enterprise and it's a very consultative approach and it's million dollar packages. That's a different salesperson. You have to know your product and your space and your ideal customer before you build a sales organization because you got to hire the right people to fulfill that role, right? That's step one. So at Helium, we decided we want to work with mid-sized businesses and enterprise. So who can sell to those? And what I did is, is that, you know, we picked that niche because A, I knew that niche really well. B, we'd been really successful there. And I knew how to, to crush it in sales in that, that area. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, our plan was pretty simple. Let's just clone myself, essentially, right? And then yeah. we just figured out, why am I able to sell this product so well? And it came down to figuring out, you know, it's a combination of both being able to talk the left brain, create the left brain numbers and data, but being able to have creativity. And you need a high level salesperson who can do both of those, right? Wow, it's not okay. just, it's not just reading a script. So it's not a call center that will not work to sell bigger organizations, but it's also not the, you know, I can't get a guy out of Oracle making three fifty a year and have him come sell SEO because he only wants to sell to CXOs of, of $12 billion companies with long sales cycles. And that's just not, SEO, that's not what we sell either. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you got to know who you want to be when you grow up. Then the next thing is look at the, the best reps and figure out what is the compensation you need to pay to get the right people for that, right? So, you know, just to kind of throw out these numbers, you say, okay, look, a, a small business SEO salesperson, let's say that, you know, on target, they make 50, okay? Mm -hmm. Well, if, you, if that's what you build your model around, but then you want to hire someone there and try to get them to go sell a bunch of mid-sized business, they're going to take the job because you're going you're gonna to offer more compensation, but they're not mm -hmm. going to be successful because they're not going to know how to sell mid-sized business. Yeah. Right? Well, they, they're, they're going for their own um, reasonings why, not necessarily what's right. in your best interest. 100%. Because in sales, the number one predictor of success is future, is past performance, right? Mm, yeah. So. So I'm not looking to hire someone who might be able to make it. Heck no, man. I want to hire someone who's already selling to the same type of companies, selling a similar type product or similar like level of both a consultative sale, a you know, seven, six, five, six, seven figure product, or multiple decision makers, same sales cycle, B to B, not B to C. I want to get someone who's in the very similar space and mm -hmm. then bring them over. Right. And so then I have to say, okay, if like I'm gonna poach from other other big marketing organizations or software companies. How much are the reps making? What's their base salary? What's their what's their on target earnings? How much is split base versus commission? And I'm going to have to offer something competitive to that group, or I'm to get those people to come over and sell, right? So that's the next thing you got to do. You got to be very realistic about who you really need on your sales team to hit the objectives, and how much you need to pay them, and how to get those people to come over to your team. It, it sounds like really you guys come up with your own. A lot of companies use an ideal customer profile, right? For who mm -hmm. do they want to work with? It sounds like you're developing your own ideal candidate profile for who's the type of individual, Absolutely. where are they coming from, and really developing that overall structure for not only recruiting, but then also the whole life cycle of who's going to be on your sales team and, and where and why. I really like that. That's really powerful. That's what we do. And so us, we have very exactly what we want this rep to look like, to act like, to be like in their background. And so I need somebody who can prospect, who's not to, you know, who's not all oh, prospecting is beneath me, right? But, mm -hmm. but someone who can also sit and run a boardroom. So if you can't sit at a boardroom table and run that meeting, you're not our guy. 
Wow. Right? So really that duality between, hey, they've got to be own, they've got to be able to hunt and look at what they, you know, uh, go out and hunt and and kill what they eat, but then also be able to present to yes. high level CEOs. Yeah. That's a that that <laughs> sounds about. like that's a that sounds like some people could be like, wow, that's really a needle in a haystack. But when you actually do the hard work to create this ideal candidate profile, you probably know exactly where to go from. You probably have a couple of different areas. Well, hey, I can yep. look here, we can recruit from there. Uh, since you have that level of granularity when it comes to who you're, who's going to be the best sales fit for you. Yeah. And so there's, there's two things that I want to riff off with that just to like for sales leaders who are watching and, and yeah, owners. Please. Um, number one is why we did it this way, right? And by the way, I learned a lot of this through the, the school of hard knocks, you know, <laughs> hiring salespeople and not working out and be like, okay, what did I do wrong? Right. Cause, cause the more ownership you take, right. Extreme ownership is if a salesperson fails in my company, it's my fault. Because yeah. I hired the wrong person, I trained them incorrectly, something went wrong, but it needs to be my fault mm -hmm. because then I can learn from it. I love and so, that. So the first thing is figuring out, okay, how do I hire the right person? But then what's my training process? What's my sales process? How do I get this person successful? But at the end of the day, I figured out very quickly, I, I need someone who comes in already trained. I, we do not have time as a rapidly growing company to train someone on how to prospect, how to do sales meetings, how to build rapport. How to, how to run a board. We don't have time for that. Yeah. So I need people who are already trained. So one of the things that we do that's a hack, I would encourage other people, figure out how to get the people in who already know what you need to know for your sales team. So for us, if you haven't done outside sales at quota, hit quota for a B2B company that's selling five-figure deals already, you don't qualify because I only want sales reps who come in who have three to four to five years of quota hitting experience in a B2B product. So you can be a great person, you can be a relative, you could be a neighbor, right? But if you don't have that yep. specific skill set, if you don't have that first check, doesn't matter. You do not pass go, do not collect $200. Exactly. So then once I figure that out, it's like, okay, so that's a that gives me a pool already, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now we know to look for, hey, look for people two to five years experience. I don't want more than five because if someone's a sales rep who's been selling at a company for 10 years, they're making way too much. They're not going to switch, right? Because yeah. good salespeople by that have a huge book built up. They're making yep. way too much money. But from two to five years, here's what we look for. Number one, companies with crappy culture, right? So they might work yeah. at a really big organization with a really garbage culture, which means they'd want to come and work at Helium because they have a great culture. Number two is I find the people who are hitting quota, but then we look for people who have a small territory or don't have opportunity to grow to that next level. And uh -huh. so they already are trained and they're already hitting quota, but their quota, they couldn't make as much as they could make here, Right. And then the third benefit is now you know what kind of companies you want to poach from because I look for companies with great sales training who hire really good sales reps to give them really good training. And if you, if you look for big publicly traded firms, reps typically don't make it after quarter after quarter if they're not hitting quota. Yeah. If someone's been there for three years, they're, they're, on, they're on quota or they would have been let go. So yeah. that tells you automatically this person knows how to perform. How have you found what companies have good sales programs? Is that just through talking through people and shaking a lot of hands, meeting a lot of people, a lot of research? How do you go about trying to find organizations that have a good training culture that could be a great feeder program for you? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Um, so I'll throw a couple of names out and you'll probably, you know, know Xerox is one, yeah. right? Enterprise, mm -hmm. car rental. These companies are known for having epic sales training programs because they're selling into incredibly saturated markets but they're big players and the only way they win is by having better trained reps. Yep. Right. Yeah. So, so look for companies like that. Okay. Um, also you can look for local companies. Um, you know, we have a couple local firms like TQL where, you know, they have, they hire hundreds of salespeople a year. Um, and the people who like, they have a 90% churn rate of, wow. of employees after, after six months. So after six months, nine out of 10 employees will have quit their sales job who just can't hack it. But someone who's been there for two or three years is a probably a pretty dang good salesperson. Probably great. Yeah, absolutely. But if they can survive that level. Absolutely, right? It's the diamond in the rough, right? After the compression, the charcoal turns into a diamond. Yeah, perfect um, for you. So so take a Xerox. So one of our top reps we hired out of Xerox, and it was exact perfect fit. She'd been at Xerox, great sales training, um, you know, had been successful, been hitting quota, you know, knew how to perform quarter over quarter, knew how to hit those goals. We didn't have to train any of that. So day one, when she started, it was not, here's how to build rapport. Here's, she knew all of that. Yeah. It was, here's the bath, our system, our email process. Here's our databases. Here's our product. Go off and crush it. And she, you know, we learned things from her. And so it's, it's figuring that out. So my, my encouragement to anyone listening is make a list of five to 10 of the top organizations known for their sales training, mm -hmm. right? 
you know, like the, the enterprise or the Xerox or, you know, the, you can also go to, to um, SaaS companies are a really good place, right? You know, like mm-hmm. Asana, like that. Yeah. Go get the guys selling B2B or B2C that matches your product for organizations that are really well known for having great sales training cultures. Those would be really good places to poach from. I really love that. I love how your brain works, Tim, right? Because you're 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 cutting down the amount of time it takes for someone to speed up and to ramp up, right? To get to quota because you've done so yep. much work in the beginning, right? So much research on your ideal candidate profile, the companies you're going to poach from. Most companies are just simply, you know, they struggle to even put together a good job description or what totally. is the scorecard that we're going to keep a rep um, on task with or, or try to, what's their quota, right? But you take it an extra step of here's the company we're going to poach from. Here's the companies we're going to recruit after. Here's exactly the type of person. And I've got to imagine that that level of research on the front end probably saves so much, not only time, but also heartache, angst, um, a lot of of the things that come from hiring a salesperson that's not working out for your organization. I really, really love that. And that's, man, there's just some great gold nuggets in there that any business can apply. Yeah. And I'll say a couple last things. So when we follow that, so I've talked about taking risks and trying things outside of that. When we take have taken risks and tried things outside of that framework, um, you know, it's seventy five percent of the time has failed to mm. deliver results. When we followed that framework I just lined out, it's a hundred percent of the time we've delivered results. That wow. rep has we've we've had reps who've come who've hit quota and are crushing it. And so the, the thing is, figure that out for your company and stick with it, and, and be willing to be to 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 be true to it. the The second thing I want to say too is. It really does come down to thinking about that ideal cust- the, the ideal client or ideal candidate. There we go, ideal candidate profile, and take time to get that really, really right and think through that because that'll save you a ton of time. Also, one of my uh, CEO coaches I work with, Cameron Harold, um, great guy, but he said if your company is going to grow rapidly, you do not have time to train. Mm-hmm. You need to hire people who know what they're doing already. And sales is something that takes a long time to learn, a long time, and there's so much nuance to it, right? I've studied this inside and out, but the, the difference between a, a good sales rep and a bad sales rep is is literally night and day. A good sales rep will drive millions of dollars in revenue for a company, and a bad sales rep might not drive anything. You mm-hmm. might completely lose all of your investment. Yeah. And so it, it's not a linear thing. It's literally great reps are worth a fortune, and and bad reps are cost just cost you money. So take the time to get the right reps because it can completely swing the the success of your company. Yeah, I so agree with that, right? Good reps can be exponential in what they can bring, not only to a company, because it's not just that top line revenue, or it's not just that Mm -hmm. MRR or ARR number. There's so much other benefit that comes from a really successful sales rep. I love that. That that is awesome. Well, I know uh, we're going a little bit over, but there's so many good nuggets in here. Um, But I think this is a good place to transition to the final five. Now, these are five rapid fire questions that I'll ask Tim and you answer. Are you ready? I'm ready. Awesome. All right. Favorite sales related movie? Ooh, Boiler Room. Boiler Room. Classic. Love that one. Favorite sales book? Um, Go for No. Go for No. Do you know who that's by? Um, let me Google it real quick. I go. This, this book is amazing. I, I, I have to get a Go for No by Richard Fenton. Awesome. All right, I'll include that in the show notes. Richard, Richard Fenton and Andrea Waltz, go for no. Um, awesome. One of the best sales books you'll ever read. Last one is How I Raise Myself from Failure to Success and Selling by Frank Betzger. That is a classic one as well. From uh, I think he wasn't he around your area as well, or am I thinking that he was in New York uh, City? I think he was Chicago. I could be wrong though. Yeah, that, great. That, that book is what made me a successful sales rep. That is a classic book that not too many people know about. I really like that one as well. Uh, what do you know now that you wish you would have known when you first got into sales, Tim? Everything I just told you about how to hire <laughs> the right reps. That would have my first company. It was a it was a nightmare. Like it, every rep we hired was unsuccessful. Well, we didn't, and this is how I learned all of these mistakes and and learning points. So, if if I going back to being a sales rep, is there anything I could have learned? Uh, I would have learned the process of building rapport, really, mm. truly building rapport with somebody because at the end of the day, people buy from who they like, right? And, yeah. and and you pass trust and people buy emotionally. So learning how to build rapport at the very outset and truly understanding that would have been the first thing I would have learned. Like that. Like that a lot. Best purchase of 2020 under $100. Doesn't have to be business related either. 
um this webcam i'm using right now i got the kyo razor so it's got the little like light in it and like super high quality because of like how much everything turned into zoom yeah i say this this webcam was an absolute game changer and that's the kyo razor okay and your favorite social media follow again doesn't have to be business related um my favorite social media follow yes who i follow yes who you're following uh probably gary v love it probably gary v would be the the guy is inspirational man he never sleeps he literally never. works 20 hours a day it's insane the guy insane. is nuts yeah but he is an awesome awesome follow tim if our listeners want to connect with you where can they do so where's the best place to find you on the internet yeah sounds good i'm all over linkedin um so i've got a big following there if you just you know tim warren helium seo you'll find me easily um connect with me there um feel free to go to our website uh, if you go to our website you can contact us directly through there or my you know myself drop us a line or a note, you know, I can, it'll, they'll, my team will forward it to me, um, you know, or if you want to reach out, send me an email, just Tim at helium hyphen SEO.com. Awesome. I'll make sure that that's all in the show notes as well. Tim, this was an awesome conversation. I think there's some huge takeaways that companies can start immediately incorporating into the recruiting, training, and onboarding process that's going to yield exponential results as we talked about. So thanks so much for taking us inside your sales playbook, Tim. Thanks for having me, Mark. It It was a blast. My pleasure.